let me do what I like to do with when I do this presentation a lot is I'm going to ask you some questions. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you a few things and I want you to tell me if they're a comic book. Okay. Or in particularly, it might be a video. It might be a comic. It might be a stuffed animal or a toy over. All right. So was this a comic book? Yes. Yes, this is a Marvel comic book. This is Black Panther. Um, let's try this one. Oh, uh, yes. This was on CW. That was a comic book. Yes, this is a DC comic book. All right, so now let's, what about these guys? Comic book or movie? Movie. Correct. Yeah, it's it's Star Wars character. Now, what's funny is they're in comic books now, but these were a movie first. Let's talk about mm. this guy. Comic book or no? Comic. Yeah. yeah. Comic. Yes, Spider-Man. All right. Spider-Man. Now, this might be a little tricky. Comic book or not? Wait. Yes. Yeah. That is a comic book. Yep. This is an original graphic novel. What about this? Comic book or not? That is not a comic book. This is a comic book. Dang it! All right. What about this? Comic book or not? Wait. That is a comic book. That is a comic book. That is a comic book. That's a comic book. It's a Batman comic book. Now, what about this? Real comic thing. book. Definitely. Comic book. Now, here's the trick. What about this? Look how thick that is. What do you think? Ugh. Comic book? Yay or nay? Um, it's a comic book. Yay? Yep. So. Comic books come in various shapes, sizes, and formats. What you just saw was an assortment. Um, the only thing not a comic were the Star Wars characters. Look at the different sizes you're going to see here. This was one I showed you. This is the other. Now, these are sitting flat. But, I mean, you can see they're different sizes, different shapes. Comics come in all kinds of different sizes and shapes. And comic books inspire all kinds of different things. You'll see toys, you see movies, you see TV shows, you see all kinds of things and they all came from comic books. Now I'm gonna ask you guys some questions. You feel free to jump in. Um, when do you think the first comic book was created? Uh, Jackson's raising his hand. Go ahead. I believe that's seven huh 1827 that's a little little old um how about 1934 the first comic book was called famous funnies number one so what they did is how many of you have ever seen a newspaper and you've seen the comic strip section right so what this company yeah. did was they took the newspaper comics and they got all the comics that made one story and they printed them in a book and they resold them and that created comic books that was the first comic book now why do you think they did this one of the reasons uh, they did this so one reason they did this was because they owned the material so it was reprinting it and it was creating more money but two you gotta remember this is 1934 the TV's not invented. No cell phone, no laptop, no Game Boy. None of that exists. It's entertainment. At this time, you had the radio, movies, and if you were lucky, you might own a TV. But you're probably only getting one channel. So comic books in the 1930s were a large source of entertainment. And they started off being five and 10 cents a piece. You're now your average comic book, brand new off the shelf, $3.99, $4. So you can see how it changed. 
Now, when do you think the first superhero appeared? The first superhero mm. appeared in 1938. When do, who do you think the first superhero was? And remember, we're talking comic books. So the first newspaper superhero was the Phantom, who later became a comic book character. I'll give you a clue. He's had multiple movies. They call him the Big Blue Boy Scout is his nickname. Jackson, Jackson go ahead and say it. <laughs> yeah. Say it. Did you say Captain America? Yep, your favorite. Nope. Uh, nope. It's Superman. Superman was the first superhero. He was created in 1938. And he was the first comic book superhero that launched everything you have that what makes up today. He's your oldest superhero. Everybody knows that cover where he's lifting the car, you know, into the air and saving people. Now that comic book, when it came out was 10 cents. Nowadays, to find that comic book is a minimum of $100,000 in most cases on up. But comic books back then, they weren't thought of like they are now. Comic books were disposable. You read them, you got rid of them. They were just an entertainment source. So collecting really wasn't the thing. Now let's fast forward a little bit. Most of the characters that you know nowadays, Batman, Superman, Captain America, these characters are, dec are almost, in some cases, 100 years old. They're, you know, 80 plus in most cases. They've gone through re-changes over and over again, changing who these characters are. And that's because the writers and the artists are not trying to tell you the same story. They're still trying to entertain you through these characters. So it's pretty impressive when you think about something that in most cases is 75 to 80 years old, that is still around and still relevant and they still have new material. So that's a little history on comics just so you've kind of got that. Now let's talk about the people that work on a comic book. So I'm a comic book writer, that's one person. How many people do you think normally work on a comic book? Jackson, do you know? Um, usually, usually about four people. Okay. Um, Deb, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so there's a little, sometimes there's as little as two and sometimes there's as many as eight. It just depends but you have people who are writers like me, you have people that are artists that draw the book, you have people who are called colorists, and their whole job is just the color of the picture. You have people called letterers, that literally their whole job is just to draw the letters in the words, in comics, that's a whole job. Now, you probably can't see it, but do you see the black outlines around some of these pictures, these objects? There's a whole person that does that. His job's called an inker. And then you have people that are called editors, who are basically like your teachers. Editors go through and they find things that are wrong, or they give you advice to make things better. And then, you start to get into like the production side of it. So you have printers, shippers, things like that. But there's a bunch of different people that help to make a comic book. It's not just one or two people. It sometimes can be. Um, there's a very famous comic book called Mouse. And only one person yeah. does everything. Art Spiegelman does everything in that book. So there's, you know, there's sometimes where it's everybody, but normally it's a collaborative effort. It's people working together. So I think Ian was here early enough when I was saying, I work with two different comic book artists. One of them lives in Indonesia, all the way around the other side of the world from where I'm at now. Different time zones, everything. We talk like this all the time when we would work on the book. Now I have another artist who lives in Georgia. So we talk the same way. But when we're creating a comic book, a lot of times, the first thing we want to do is we come up with the idea. Can you guys still hear me? So we yeah. come up with an idea. Yeah. 
So my comic book is called The Amazing Adventure Superior. It's about a little boy, an amputee superhero without any superpowers. So the idea of the comic was to teach people that people with disabilities could do anything they could do and not to judge them differently. Now, what you might find in a comic is what we call a plot. And that's what the book is going to be about. So I gave you kind of an overview of what Sam is, but when we break down each issue or we look at things like this, there's usually an overlying plot to them. And that's the, the central part of that story for that issue. Or in a lot of cases, comic books get collected like this because those stories go on multiple issues. So this book is called Batman Hush. It's 12 comics make up this entire story. But if you were to read Antihero right here, it's an original graphic novel. This is all just one story. So comics, like I said, they come different ways. But most commonly you see are just the little single issue pages. That's what most people recognize as a comic book. So what happens is, is when we come up with these comic books, what we usually do is we do something we have, it's called brainstorming, where it might be you, it might be the artist, it might be your editor, it might be you and your friend. And you're sitting there and you're talking about, hey, what should we do in the story? And then once you kind of come up with that idea, that plot, then it's how do we tell the story? And you start breaking it down. So you're going through it and you're figuring out certain things like, okay, how do we start the story? How do we get to what we call in the story, the kind of the most important part in a book is usually it's called the climax. How do we get to there? And then how do we bring it back down and wrap the story up? How do we end it? Now, comics are notorious because they like to end on what we call as a cliffhanger. They always want you to come back for more. Now, one of the reasons is, is because most comics are only 32 pages nowadays. And a fun fact, Why actually, usually, what was that? Because there's bags of rocks in my trunk. <laughs> and then you go. So most comics, like I said, 32 pages. Ironically, 12 pages of those are ads nowadays. So they don't have enough story in a regular comic book to tell it. So they tell it over multiples. But another reason they do that is my fit. You know, it's this one, it's money. They need money. If you don't, the entire story one thing, you don't get money from the next issue. And money is how they keep making comics. So that's kind of part of that method. But when you're sitting there and you're brainstorming, you're coming up with the ideas for your comic book characters, a lot of things can go on. You can be, you can have the idea for the character first. You can have the idea for the story. Say you saw something, whether it's on the news, it was at school, while you were at the grocery store, and you're like, that would be a cool story. And you want to tell the story. So you got your story first, but then you need to figure out the character. So some of that stuff happens in different orders. Nothing ever happens in the same order. Sometimes you might draw the character first. So you know who Batman is. Batman actually started off as a picture before he ever got to a story. So he started off as a picture. And the idea then came from Batman. Now, Batman's got a funny story. Bob Kane is credited as creating Batman. But it's only been in the last 15 years that they've begun crediting Batman's silent creators. These were other people that Bob worked with. There's a great documentary on Hulu called Batman and Bill. And it's all about Bill Finger, who was this hidden writer of Batman, who had most of the ideas for Batman. Because like I said, Bob Kane just, he's an artist. He only had a picture. And he went to Bill and Bill was like, oh, this would be really cool. This is what we can do. And when I'm with my comic book friends and peers, that's what we sometimes do. We might be like, you know, Captain America, this is a great, you know, character. This is a great story, but this is how I would do it, or this is how I would tell it. And we're trying to change that. So we're writing our own stories. But a lot of times you have an idea or something that happens. Now, for me, it was losing my leg. 
Now, normally I do this presentation in person so you can see me without the leg, but I don't have a leg. This is actually my leg. You can see it, it's the foot, it's pretty dirty, but that's my leg. Um, I lost my leg. And when I wrote Superior Sam, the first issue, the idea was to teach kids about people like me and how someone might lose a leg. So I had a story. I actually, I used to teach a kid who was on the spectrum, he was autistic. And he didn't understand why I wasn't gonna be his teacher and that's because I had to have surgery to lose my leg. So I wrote a story, I wrote this very first comic to teach him what was gonna happen in a way he could understand. Now what's funny is, is when we made it into a comic book, we made it, we're able to make so much more out of it because we were able to give you so much extra information and all these other things. But what we wanted to really do was we wanted to set him up with a world. So we introduced characters, you know, it says Superior Sam, but there's also Billy B, there's Sam's mom, there's Super Silas, there's Viva Fox, there's Fast Freddy, there's Marvelous Michael, there's all these different characters that spin out and they don't necessarily have to come from the same issue at the same time. You know, one of the funnest things with being a creator is, is getting inspired, seeing something and going, that would be really cool to put in my book. Now, one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to just copy somebody else's idea. You want to come up with your own idea, but it's very easy to do. You know, it doesn't take much to have an idea. You just need a little motivation. And one of the most important ways to get motivation is going out and exploring. It's reading. It's even watching TV. You gain a lot of knowledge by just watching and learning and what you see. So it's really important. I, I just saw a Twitter debate. I don't know if anybody here has Twitter, but I saw a Twitter debate amongst two comic creators. One was a writer, one was an artist. And they were talking about, if you make comics, do you need to read comics? And the creator does like me. He does a lot of independent stuff. But the artist does mainstream superheroes like Batman, Captain America, Superman, Spider-Man, the X-Men, things like that. And his argument was, you have to read these comics so you know what these characters look like and what's going on in their stories. Because there's all these years of history. And the indie guy was like, why do I need to read any of that? I'm making up my own stories. So they had this huge debate. And it was very interesting to watch them go back and forth because they pointed out all these different things. But the one thing they agreed at in the end was, whether you want to read comics or not, it's you need to experience things to come up with the ideas to gain the motivation to create comic books. So now when you're creating a comic book, it's almost always going to start off, like I said, with some kind of idea, whether it's a character, whether it's a story you want to tell, but it's going to come from an idea. And then you have to craft it. So if you did the activity, which was making your own comic, this is my comic. I told you there'd be stick figures, but I called my comic left, right, left, look. Now in a comic, we would call this the title, by the way. Then it's by me. And this is my name because that's the byline. It's important that you take credit for what you do. Um, don't be embarrassed by what you create. I'm showing you literally my lovely stick figures. They're not the greatest, but they're going to tell a story. And the whole idea of this comic is to teach kids how to cross the road. So you have a little girl who's going to cross the street and then Sam and Tiny Superhero. Because when I came up with this idea, this was for an organization called Tiny Superheroes. And they wanted to work with me and some artists. And they wanted to come up with little four panel comic stories with some of their kids that they work with using some of my characters with them as well. So we came up with this series. Well, we were never able to do it, but I have all these four panel stories that I came up with. So in this case, it was just how to cross a sidewalk. So you see the little girl, she's going, and then Sam and Tiny Superhero tell her, no, you forgot to look. And then in the third panel, they tell her, you look left, right, left, then you go. And then at the end, it wraps up with her on the other side of the street saying thank you to Tiny Superhero and to Sam. It doesn't have to be much, 
But there's a lot going on here. The story was trying to teach kids how to cross the street safely. Four panels, that's all it took, four. You've got drawings, you've got a narrator, you've got three different characters. We call this a word bubble. So this is where someone's speaking. You have a panel with multiple word bubbles. And these are tricky to do because if you don't know how to read a comic, this can be confusing. But usually you start with the highest panel because that's the first word bubble because that's the first thing to speak. But in this case, you can actually read any of these in the same order. That's why they're on the same level. But look at what we did. We included the row. We changed the perspective from panels to panel. So you see all this stuff. Now, how many of you caught all that? It looks very simple. It looks like what you might see in a Sunday newspaper, but there's a lot going on here. I even did something that, like I said, we inked it. So if you look very closely, you'll see the pencil underneath. Because if you wanna create a comic book, all you need is a pencil and a piece of paper. That's it. You don't need computers. You don't need pens and inking pens and paint brushes. You need a pencil, a piece of paper, and your imagination. That's all you need to do this. This took me, now comics can take anywhere in time. I've written some of my Superior Sam comics in one hour. This alone took me 45 minutes. It doesn't look like much, but I mean, this is tricky. I don't draw. So I had to come up with all how this looked. Actually, I'll show you how this comic first appeared. I drew it on the back of some recycled cardboard because I was testing it. But I also was able to draw it bigger and then I could scale it down to fit my little panels. But that's all this is. But then I took this lovely cardboard, because like I said, you don't have to spend much to make a comic book. And I just used the straight edge to do some of the lines and the roads and things like that, or to make sure that all the characters were on the kind of the same plane. It was free cardboard. It didn't cost me anything. Comic books can be super cheap. And that's the coolest thing about comic books. You will see comic books that cost you anywhere from free 99, that's free, to 10 bucks in some cases, even more. Some of these big books you saw, that big book is 100 bucks. You know, that's the beauty too of libraries and places like this. You can go there and check these things out for free. You know, if you want to read my comic right now, you can go on places like Webtoon and Tapas, and you can read all eight issues of my comic for free. You don't have to pay anything. But if you met me in person, this might cost you $3 or $3.50, depending what issue you buy. But that's how people also make money, and they learn they eat. Now, in my case, all the money just goes back to making more comics. But when you start looking for, like, older comics... Like this book might run you five, 10 bucks, even though it says $2 on the price tag. And let's talk about this. Um, can you all see this comic okay? So you have the title here. You've got, we call this the corner box. And usually in the corner box, we'll have the price and the issue number. Then you have this lovely picture. Now what they've started to do is also put somewhere on here, usually who created it. So you usually we'll see the writer, the, the, the artist, the inker, and the colorist usually, or you'll see the biggest names. And that's one of the saddest parts about comics is not everybody gets credit all the time. You know, you might have this great idea, but you might never see your name in it because you weren't involved in that process sometimes. So, you know, it's also important if you work with somebody, you give them credit. That's like why when you read my comic, you see my name and you see my artist's name. Or if you go on Comixology, which is where you can read comics online, it's another place. You'll see what each of us does. And like Azami has like 10 jobs compared to my two. But it doesn't mean that I do any less work than he does sometimes. Comic books are all about collaboration. So when you're working on a comic book, you're talking with, you're coming up with the story and you're trying to put it together into a way that tells a story. And you're not gonna get it right the first time. That's one of these funniest things is, I meet so many people that think you have to do it right the first time. And you don't. 
it's okay to mess up. Some of the greatest creations sometimes in comics just come from a bad look or a mistake or something like that. Because you saw something you did wrong, but it might inspire you in a different way to do it right. So even if you make a mistake, it's not the end of the world. Even if you don't get get it, you know, in 45 minutes, it's okay. I know when I work with, to give you an idea, to make one issue of Superior Sam, these are eight to 10, eight to 12 pages normally. This takes about four months. Now it takes about two, it takes me about a month to write the script. It takes about a month to a month and a half to draw it. And then we have to print it. Then we have to do a little advertising for it. But what, you know, there's a whole process to it. And the thing is the entire time we're doing this, we're trying to make this better for you. So like when I write the script, now if you don't know what I'm talking about when I say a script, it kind of looks like a movie script. So you'll have like the title, the name, usually who's involved, some information on it. And then you'll start to see it. So it says like panel one, image one, who's speaking, panel two. And that's how you do it. And this is what I send to my artist. And he looks at this and everybody has their own style. But this turns into this eventually. And it's funny because as you're going through it, you know, I give these scripts to my artist immediately. As soon as I think I've got the basic outline. So they can start the art side of it because that's going to take longer, but they don't put any of the words in because we might change that down the road. Because I will tell you right now, I am a horrible speller and I barely know where a period goes, but I work with an editor and his whole job is to literally tell me if I spelled something wrong, if I missed a period somewhere or I put a comma in there when I shouldn't have, but he also sits there and reads it and goes, hey, maybe we change this line to this line. It's a little shorter and might sound better. So there's, there's a lot of going back and forth. And what eventually will happen is we'll get to a point where we'll say, this is as good as we're going to get it. And then the artist puts in the letters. And then he sends me what we call as a proof, which is just usually these pages. And then me and my editor, we look at them for any mistakes. And then we send any mistakes we see back because like I said, my first artist is Ami lives in Indonesia. He speaks three other languages other than English. He sometimes doesn't spell things in English correctly. It's not his fault. He speaks three languages. I barely speak one and a quarter. So like, it's really impressive to work with somebody like that. But sometimes I have to be like, Hey, there's no E at the end of shop because he knows British English to a degree. So it's really funny sometimes to work with him or when I send him an image, like an idea of something, like when we did this first issue, do you know what this is? We call this in the background here? It's a playground, right? A zombie didn't know what a playground was. Not like this. So I had to go to a school and take pictures of their playground and send them to a zombie so he could understand what I was talking about. Because Azami over in Indonesia, I'm sure someplace they have a playground like this. But he didn't know. And I didn't want it to just be swings and a slide. Because that was what he originally drew. And when I showed him this, he was like, this is really cool. Now, it was a lot of fun because we did all of this. And we created this. And we got to see it from an idea in my head come to a piece of paper. It didn't take that much to do that. So it was really cool, but it took time. It takes money. You know, I don't make any money from this. And I, and I don't want to sound like I'm talking about money, but money is important when you're making comic books. You know, because you have to pay for some supplies sometimes. You might have to pay your artist. You might have to pay the printer, the person that prints this. If I could tell you anything, one of the, the lessons that I learned late in comic book making was don't print it right away. Put it online for free. You'll save a lot of time, money that way. And you also build a fan base because at the end of the day, if you can't go out and you can't promote, which is go to events like where I went to the library and you can't go to comic con or to the comic book store or wherever will have you. And you can't promote your book. 
you don't have any fans, so then you have to weigh out, is it, are you doing this for you or are you doing it for somebody else? And a lot of creators will tell you, I do my comics for me. It's just a bonus if somebody else enjoys it. So did anybody actually make any comics? Ian, yeah. Jackson, did you guys make your own comics at all? Um, I didn't make one out of those, but a couple of days um, a while ago, I started one. I know Jackson. I did make I did make a comic once. Okay. It was about emojis or something. Okay, that's cool. Do you have it? Uh, yes, I do. Except I have no idea where it is. Okay, it happens. <laughs> Um, so if we go back to the Batman story a little bit, I'll tell you a funny thing. The idea for the Batman character, Bob Kane claims he drew as an elementary school kid and he had it in a trunk that he had forgotten about until he remembered it when he, he saw a chance to make a lot of money. So Batman's a funny character. There's a lot of weird history with that story. But, um, do you guys have any questions or anything? I want to know uh, if Deb drew anything. Nah. What was that? Uh, did you draw anything? I said no. No? Okay. I did. I drew. Oh. It's not in a comic, but it's kind of just cool. Oh, wow. It's kind You're of just You're really cool. good. It's better than my stick <laughs> Yeah. So it's funny. I, um, I always like when I see when, when I do the drawing side of the activity. My favorite part for me is when people make their own characters. I see Batman, Superman, Captain America all the time. But I always enjoy when someone's got their own character and their own idea because that's what grows the industry. But it's also in a lot of ways, it adds diversity and it expands the industry. And I think that's one of the most important things you see nowadays is trying to make comics for everybody and i one of the, the the one of the saddest things i ever saw was i saw a creator like myself go to a really big and famous creator who told him he couldn't draw he gave him a free copy of his comic and this happens all the time and they're like hey will you just look at it and give me any advice and he said yeah you can't draw well, what was funny about it, and I'm not making fun of this, was he said, oh, that's funny. He's like, here's my card. And he was the inker that actually inked that guy's last comic book. He was just trying to expand himself. But the guy didn't pay attention to who he even worked with. And it was one of these things where it was like, oh. And that was something I was trying to tell somebody. I saw somebody who was like, I can't draw, I can't make comics. And I'm like, can you write? And they're like, I'm not very creative. I was like, can you outline, can you trace? And he said, oh yeah, I trace all day. I was like, congratulations, you could be an anchor. Um, they're like, well, what if I don't want to do that? I was like, are you good with colors? Yeah, 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 I can color all the time. Stay right in the lines, no problems. You could be a colorist. That's pretty cool. And then I happened you know, you see sometimes people's handwriting and that's where letterers come in. Um, letterers are like kind of the most forgotten part in comic books because you don't think about it. When you're thinking about things that are in a comic book, so often you just think about the picture, the words that you're reading, but you don't think about all these other jobs that are associated with it. And it's really funny because we talk about how important these background people are that do these other things because they make, sometimes they can make or break a comic. They can make it better or they can make it worse. It all just depends. But in a lot of cases, these are the people that make it better. It's your inkers, your colorists, and your letterers. Because I told somebody once, one of my, um, one of my least favorite things and when I say this, I'm telling you this is a personal preference, is when you look at the letters that somebody's done in a comic, and it's just something they've typed across the computer. Anybody can do that. And it's a really great way because it's tricky to come up with the spacing and things like that, and to know, like, to fit everything into one little area. 
but if you don't use the right font, it doesn't look right sometimes. Or when they don't draw the word bubbles by hand and they use standard little cutout ones because you have all this huge space around it sometimes. And it takes up all this extra space so you don't see any of this stuff here. One of the things we like to do with Sam is we like to sometimes put little hidden things in the comics. And this is always fun because a lot of people know that we do this, so they try to find them. So this is issue eight. Um, this is, I don't remember what page, but if you read, how many of you notice anything hidden in this comic, this panel? You see anything like extra that might not necessarily be important? Um, yeah, I do see, see a sign that says health ad advice. Right. It says health advice. And it says exercise, eat plenty of vegetables, and get lots of sleep. So we gave you some extra advice. But most people, what they see are all the characters, the, ven the word bubbles, the narrator bubble, and this vending machine because it's an part because we referenced it in the story but they don't sometimes look at stuff like this we also wrote out the names of all the different doctors we made up a bunch of different doctors names we didn't just put little squiggly lines now here's a fun one that um josh really likes to do the hidden things more than a zombie so this is the last panel what do you notice about their instruments notice anything about sam's microphone it's unplugged what about Billy's guitar strings? They're broken. <laughs> yeah, we had all these little hidden little things that we did extra that you don't see right away. And one of my favorite things is, is some comic book creators, when you're looking at comics, they like to hide things in the pictures. Like there's one famous creator who likes to draw, anytime he draws Catwoman, he always puts a cat in every panel somewhere. So you might be in a building in a library looking at a row of books, but if you look, there might be a book with a little cat on the side. Because that's what he does, he hides a cat in every panel. So it's really fun sometimes. You can do these little extra things. One of the most important things we thought of with, Th with Sam was trying to talk about the stigmas or what someone like Sam might go through. When a lot of people, all they do is read, but do you know how many kids tell me they see, they notice that these kids look at Sam, they're staring and they look funny at him? Most people tell me, you know, after the fact they've read it once or twice, they're like, oh, you know, I noticed that all the kids look sad or they're staring at him. Why is that? And I was like, well, that was something we wanted to hide was that people stare at sometimes people when they're different or they look at them funny where they feel sad for that person. And they don't even know why sometimes. But you know, we did that. We even did it in the background. You can see the kids back there. And it was really important. Another thing you'll see that's really a common thing in comics, I'm trying to think of one, is you might look at panels like this, where you see the classrooms, or you see lots of people, and these people might be important down the road. You know, when you're looking at this panel, you see Sam, you see Billy, you see Viva or Olivia. But down the road, some of these other kids are going to be characters in the comics. This is your first introduction to these characters. And that's something cool too. We'll talk about that because we have a couple minutes and then I'll answer a couple more questions. You know, something that makes comic books important or valuable or what goes on in them, um, it's the characters. And we like to call these appearances. So when I'm talking about Superior Sam, people are always like, When's his, where's his first appearance? Well, it's in issue one. But then someone might be like, well, where's Billy come in? Billy's in issue two. Where's Billy be at? Well, Billy first appears in issue one as just Billy, but he gets a costume in issue two. So his first appearance is actually issue one, but his first costumed appearance is issue two. So little things like that can add to value of comics. 
Um, are there any other questions? Um, well, I have something to say. Sure. I did make a comic. Jackson, you do a lot of art. I see it all the time. It's called Proof. It's called what? Proof. Crew? Like C R E W? C R U S S T. Oh, all right. What's it about? Um It's about It's about um a kid who gets it's a um a video game that but it actually isn't a video game. It's actually you're testing things, and three other kids get it, and there's only three players, and there's a bunch of, of weird things that happen, and they all have powers. That's cool. Ian, I know you said your comic was about emojis. What's it about specifically? Uh, it's like, um... It's like about two emojis, like a smiley one and a, um, a cool sunglasses emoji. I forget what happens in it because it's been so long. Okay. Hey, Deb, what's your character about, your comic about? I don't really make comic comics. I just make up backstories for all the characters I draw. So that one was a girl. She was on her way to see her grandmother because she hadn't seen her in years, and her her plane was flying over a forest and plane crashed and she ended up having to amputate her own arm because it got infected and stuff so so you said you don't write comics yet you told a whole story that was pretty good what we call what you guys just did we call that a pitch and that's how you you tell somebody about your book really fast and pitches take a lot of time so deb that was really good because you conveyed a lot of information in a short amount of time and you sold where you, you literally said, I don't do comics, but you told a story right there. And that's very impressive. You know, as your stories develop, things change and things like that. If you were to take that and just write that down, I like to do what I, what I like to call is a little pinwheel where I'll put like the idea in the middle and then I make the little spokes and then come out of it, you'd be amazed at how far you'll get by just starting with just what you had right there. You know, you said it's a plane crash. Well, where was she going on the plane crash? You know, you start there and you add to it and that builds the story. So that's something to think about. But here's the other thing too. Like I said, if you were here in the very beginning and then at the end, not every part of a comic you have to do yourself. You can always talk to other people and that's one of the funny things is a lot of people they have these great ideas and some people keep them secret because they're afraid someone's going to steal their idea or they're going to use it and you'd be amazed how many people kind of always have the same idea or like a roundabout way the same kind of principle um superhero industry actually is full of copies if you think about it how many different heroes kind of match up to one another from Marvel to DC, and they openly admit they copy off each other all the time. It wasn't a shocker. Um, that happens a lot, but one of the things that if I can give you any advice before we finish with this, it's put your work out there and show it to people. Don't be afraid to listen to show people. Listen to what they tell you too. Sometimes you'll get good advice, sometimes you'll get bad advice, sometimes you'll get hurtful advice. Not everybody's art, writing, is for everybody. But what you can do with that advice is kind of figure out what's working and what's not. When I write a story, one of the first things that I did was I went to every kid in my neighborhood where I lived. And I'd knock on the door, and their parents would answer and go, well, why is this grown person here trying to talk to my kid? And I would say, hey, I live you know, a block down the street. Um, I, you know, I know you have a kid. I'm writing a book or a comic book. Um, it's a children's thing. Here's a copy of it. Could you maybe let your kid read it or can you read it to them and just tell me what they think? And they'd be like, sure. Yeah, no problem. 
and I got advice and feedback and I was able to make the stories better. You know, sometimes when you're working on something new or you're trying something, it doesn't always work. But what happens is someone might tell you something that you didn't think of that spawns a better idea. So keep that in mind. And you know, there's ways to do it. If I can emphasize anything, it's to be polite. Or as my girlfriend likes to tell me, she's a counselor. She says, use the sandwich approach, which basically the bun is the good news and the meat is kind of the bad news. So if you like something, you start with that. Then you give them the bad news. Then you give them the good news at the end. But if you just give them all bad, they're not gonna learn anything from it. So try to expand your mind, think about when you're talking to people and write down things. I can't emphasize this enough. Um, I'm an adult. I don't think anybody here other than Afton and Gina have driver's licenses. Um, I carry my cell phone with me. I carry a it's pen. Close, no? I have a notepad with me almost all the time. And if I have an idea, I might call and leave myself a voicemail with the idea. I might literally pull off to the side of the road and write it in my notepad or text it to myself. I might literally look if I'm driving with somebody and go, hey, write this down. Like I'm writing a book right now. I'm writing my first book. Um, I can't say it's my first book, but I should say it's my first non-picture book. And I'm struggling to come up with a title. So I literally text my girlfriend the randomest things because I'm trying to think of title ideas. And she's like, what's this? I was like, just save it for later, I'll explain. Because you never know where you're gonna have an idea or when you're gonna see something and it's going to spawn an idea. That's something too. Like I said in the very beginning, you don't have to read comics to make comics, even though I think you should. But you need to go places, you need to explore, you need to read, you need to watch TV, you need to listen to music, look at art, go to museums, go to places that you've never been to if you can, and come up with ideas. Um, you will look, you can't really see it, but there's toys in my room, in this room that I'm in. There's comic book art, there's comic book pictures, all of these things. And sometimes I might just come sit up here at my desk and go, hmm, I need to come up with an idea. And I might think of, look at something and just sit there and stare at it. And I might slowly start to think about the story that it's from. And what'll happen is a lot of times I'll start to think about that story and what I'm trying to do. And it kind of gets the ball rolling and my idea starts to form finally. So you'd be amazed at where you can find motivation. It's funny, I, when I do the Sam comics, because I'm working with people with disabilities usually, where do you think I get most of my ideas? for my characters. They're from real life people. A lot of these characters are based off real life people that I know. And I go to them and I say, hey, I wanna write a story about you. And we talk about it. It was really funny. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever seen the sign language issue we did. But in this book, we actually teach you sign language. So if you've never seen it before, this is issue six. And we introduce a character named Marvelous Michael. And Michael is based off a friend of mine who's named Michael. And we were talking and he has a, like a YouTube channel and a Facebook page and all that stuff. And it's called Famous Flying Hands. And what he does is he teaches people in the public light how to say their name and what they do. So when they meet a deaf person, there's not this awkwardness because he was telling me how awkward it is to meet somebody who can't communicate with him. He looks like everybody else, but they couldn't communicate. But then we got to talking a little more and he was saying, do you know how lonely it is to look like everybody else, to have nothing wrong with you, but people don't realize that you can't hear them and you can't talk. And I never had thought about that. And I went home that night after we had this conversation and I wrote the, the rough draft of issue six all about a little boy who's new, who doesn't fit in because he can't communicate. And because he can't communicate, people make fun of him. They don't want to talk, be around him. But how something as little is going online and learning how to say hello can make all the difference for him. 
But then I was like, you know what? We need to make this cooler. And there's a Hawkeye comic book. So for those of you that don't know, in the comic book world, Hawkeye is deaf. He wears hearing aids. That's how he hears. And there's a, there's a Hawkeye comic, and I'm looking back at it because I actually just reread it. And they actually do a whole issue in American Sign Language, which is great because it's cool. It exposes people to this beautiful language. And it really is because it's one of the few languages that you have to see. But the problem with the story was they did it in sign language, but they didn't tell you what any of it meant. So if you didn't know sign language, you couldn't read it. So I was like, oh, it would be cool to put sign language in the book. So not only do we put it in the picture, but then below it, we, we give you instructions to how to do it and we tell you what it means. So we enhance this idea that I actually got from another comic book. And it's not really stealing because it's allowed. It was just this, I always remembered this issue because it was this beautiful issue. But I remember having to find a deaf person to read it to me, which was even more awkward because they literally had to write it out because they didn't speak. And I was like, well, this, this is great. But you know, it was one of these things where that little idea created another idea. So there's literally four or five different ideas in this one little comic book. So you can do a lot with that. So don't be afraid to just have an idea a starting point and then go from there. And if you get frustrated, it's okay. They always say Rome wasn't built in a day and believe me, no comic book was. But I will say Batman was built in a weekend, so he really was. He had the idea on a Friday. He went to DC, Bob Kane went to DC on a Friday and they said, bring us a story on Monday. And he brought him a story on Monday. Wasn't the best story but he brought him a story and that's how you got Batman. So do you have any last minute questions or anything? Um, I just wanted to point something out in issue seven. Sure. Whenever um, Billy is telling in, um, whenever or Billy is talking about what happened to Sam's dad, um, it tells you who's saying it, so then, and you know, or whenever, or if someone is, um, if it was, as, um, Billy, but it didn't have the thing, people all might, I think it was the other person, so, and when it, and. So we call that little clue that you see? You'll sometimes see in comics when they do flashbacks, but they're telling you the story in present time, like what Billy's doing. You'll see the little symbols or you'll see the name of the character or like a little picture of their head usually. So you know who's speaking. And they do that because they're telling you a story that may not have dialogue. And it's actually, it's a, it's a very, the issue seven, I'll tell you this, it was the hardest issue I wrote. It was actually, when I laid out the plan for Superior Sam, it was six issues original. I added issue six, this issue, because issue seven took me so many times to rewrite, even though I knew what I wanted it to be about. But when we did that flashback, somebody was like, well, are you going to let, who's going to narrate it? And I was like, well, it's going to be Sam, it's going to be Billy. Billy's going to tell the story. And they're like, well, he's not the narrator of the series. And I was like, I know he's not. That's why I'm going to put the little BB on there so you know that it's Billy B telling the story. So that was very good that you picked up on that. Yeah, it was fun because one of the questions I always got was, who's the narrator? Which, Jackson, don't tell anybody because if you haven't read issue seven, you'll learn who the narrator is in issue seven. <laughs> but... We also didn't mean for issue seven to be the last one because as you know, we have issue eight out. We're working on issue nine. We're trying to raise the money now to put nine together. The story's done. And to give you an idea, I have 14 Superior Sam stories done and scripted. And I have 21 different ideas. So Sam is nowhere near done yet. 
COVID might have slowed him down a little bit, but it didn't stop him. So <laughs> do you have a question, Afton? I do. And it kind of goes along with that. I was just wondering, because I know Deb has a design for a character and some backstories and Jackson's got at least one comic like fleshed out and Ian's got a backup. So I was wondering um, how people like how they can kind of start connecting online and finding people to fill in gaps with if like if Deb's interested in doing artwork, but not as much writing or if like Jackson's looking for someone to to fill in the pictures like would you have any suggestions on kind of where they can start finding stuff to start making their own comics available? Yeah, because I had to learn that all the hard way. Um, so the internet is a great place. Um, social media, that's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, with your parents' permission. You can literally just post, hey, looking for a writer, have an idea for a story, and you'll see people that reply. Um, it's probably all out of your age ranges, but I use Reddit. When I was looking for an artist to work with, I posted on Facebook and Reddit that I was looking for an artist, and I took replies that way. Another thing you can do is go to places. You can put up little bulletins. You would be amazed when there's a Comic-Con in a town, if you go to like the local coffee shop, not the Starbucks, but the local one, you'll see little want ads like looking for artists to connect with or things like that. And you'll find that if you go to school, I know when I was in elementary school, when I was in fifth grade, I used to have a buddy and he and I used to draw a comic book. He would draw it and I would write some of the dialogue in it. And we would do this little comic book and we would just share a notebook back and forth in class. And we actually were not friends other than when we started, we saw, I noticed he could draw and he noticed that I could tell a pretty good story. So we started to work together. So you have social media, you have putting up little ads in places, like you could do it around your neighborhood. It's not to say, you wanna make sure you do it with your parents' permission though. Don't go giving out your address and your phone number or your email without talking to somebody first. But another thing you can do is, if you go to like the library that both Gina and Afton work at, the Alexander Hamilton Memorial Free Library, they did Comic-Con last year. All those comic book people that were there, you could have walked up to and talked to. Jackson was there. I've seen Jackson at two different Comic Cons now. <laughs> Jackson could have been like, hey, Chris, I want to make a comic with you. You want to help me? So it's going out and meeting people. One of my favorite things that I see at shows is we walk around. Sometimes you'll see like little like Xerox copies of comic books. And you see people, they walk around with hundreds of these things and they go to every table with a writer and an artist or whatever. And they're handing them out and they're going, hey, check this out, let me know what you think, give me feedback. But one of the things they're doing is they're networking because you're meeting people. I have people, to give you an idea, when Azami stopped, when Azami got too busy. So to give you an idea, there's a new artist on issue eight. We're out of time, huh? I'll speed this up real fast. So when Azami was done with issue seven, he said, hey, I'm designing a video game. I can't do issue eight right now. It'll probably be a year or two before I'm free. I said, okay, that's cool. And I literally went to my Rolodex of business cards because I keep them all that I get from creators and friends. And I pulled Josh's card out because I have comics by Josh and I met Josh at a show and I shot him a message, a text. And I was like, hey, I need an artist. Do you want to work together? And he's like, yeah. And I sent him all the previous issues and I sent him the script and we started working together like that. So just going around and talking to people, that's the biggest thing. You might look at spending $5 or $50 or going to a free comic con is not worth your time. It really is because you meet people. I'll tell you a six degrees of Kevin Bacon story real quick. I, in the terms of the comic book world, am like maybe a D-level creator. So if we have A, B, C, D, E, and F, you hear this a lot in Hollywood. So you have like A-list celebrities. Well, I'm like a D-level. Like I'm honest about myself. Maybe a C on a good day. Depends on the show. But I'm like D-level. But I know A-level people. And I don't mean like I know them like I follow them on social media. 
I mean, like I could pull out my phone and email them and text them and be like, hey, I got this idea. What do you think? And do you want to know how I meet these people? Because they found my comic or I met them and we got to talking about how we're both creators and we just became friends that way. And I literally, if you go on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, which are, so, which are online platforms to raise money for comic books a lot of times, you'll see all these like self-published books like mine, but they have all these really famous creators that do like maybe a special cover or they've done like a special page or they're doing like sketches for free with the book. And you're like, well, how do you pull that off? It's probably because I met them or somebody met them and they're friends with that person. I have a buddy. We always joke in the comic book industry. When you get to be in previews, previews is this catalog that tells you everything that's coming out in the comic book world in three months, you've hit the big top. So all my friends saved their previews. But I had a buddy who I shot a picture of and I was like, dude, I got your comic and we're putting it on our shelf. And he looked at me and he's like, hey, don't tell anybody, but I just sold the rights to it. It's going to get published. It'll be in previews in three months. So we had his little self-published comic that nobody really read. And I sold it to a few friends like that. I was like, look, buy this book. Trust me, good things are going to happen with it. And people bought it. And then it hit previews and he blew up and his little $3 comic turned into a $100 book for about four months. And now it's like a $25, $30 book. All because this was the first appearance of his characters. It was just some little book that he printed out on his own. So you never know who you're going to meet. But you got to get out and you got to talk to people. Don't be embarrassed. And if you don't know how to do it, I'll tell you like I tell my girlfriend. She is terrified of meeting famous people or anyone she thinks is famous in her. Go find a chatty person like myself and bring them with you. I will sell your work as, like it's my own. I will literally walk up and go, hey, this is my boy Jackson. Jackson does this or this is Deb. Deb does this. Check this out. I got no problem putting it out there. Because you never know what it's going to be like when someone sees your work. I'll tell you the greatest feeling in the world is when someone more famous than you promotes your stuff and you didn't pay them to do it. That Twitter retweet is huge. It can make or break a book sometimes. And how do you do that? You get out there and you talk to people about it and you try to meet as many people as you can. So... I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I hope you had a good time. I hope you learned something. And if I can encourage anything, it's keep creating. Keep going and don't throw it away. Don't get rid of it. You never know where a 10-year-old idea might be the inspiration for the next best thing. So I just, I just want to point this out, but on issue four, it shows him imagining fight fighting a monster while in the actual comic he's actually fighting three bullies yep so that comic book cover is actually an inspiration of fantastic four number one um i wanted to say thank you to one of my favorite comic book creators of all time so we did an homage cover to him for that book also I'll talk about this in the team class, but uh, cool comic book covers sell comic books faster than what's on the inside. So when in doubt, sometimes you gotta put the cool cover because even though a cool bathroom cover is awesome, <laughs> sometimes you gotta look at the back to get the whole story, so. But I hope you all have a good day and thanks to the library for having me. Thanks, Chris, this was great. Yeah, thank you very much. And hey, if you guys have any questions, um, I will put this in the comments for you. This is my website. You can actually shoot me an email right through my website. I'm more than glad to talk to any of you. Or if you, okay. ask, oh, if you ask the library, have your parents ask Afton and Gina. They will give you my email and your parents can reach out to me or you can through them. And so since you might not be able to go to Comic-Cons and thanks so much this summer,
Chris might be a great person to start with if you have a good idea that you'd like to kind of explore more. Thanks. Thank you guys again. I hope you have a good day. Thanks everyone for coming. See ya. Bye. See you later. Thinking. <laughs> Bye. Bye. See ya. Bye, Jackson. Bye, Deb. Bye, Ian. Landon, I think, is gone already. All right. Were you going to put your email in the... I guess Gina has your email address. <laughs> it's in the comments, yeah. Oh, I, okay. Oh, just the website's in the comments. Yeah, oh, I, oh, was, I couldn't type the email out fast enough. Oh, it's just sent to me privately. That's why you can't see it often. Yeah. Okay. But there actually is a way to go on the website and just shoot me an email. So yeah, cool. Jackson was actually at your con. Jackson's still on the thing. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jackson. <laughs> That's cool. So. Okay, well, um, I guess this is our break time, and then we'll be back on at a little before two for the teen one. Okay. Um, I know Jackson's still here, but then I'm going to go ahead and cut out. But thank you so much, Chris, for oh, yeah, talking no today. It was very interesting. I feel like I learned a lot about what goes into making a comic book. Yeah, lots of comments or critiques. Um, it's always tough depending on the age levels when you have multiples. It, yeah, and I think it's, like, I appreciate you being willing to do this, and I feel like it requires a lot of flexibility just with having to be online and not really knowing how many people are going to show up and how interactive people will be. So Jackson is, like, the ideal person where he's into it, and so, yeah. So, so I think that it was fun. a little different, just so Gina knows, like, because I imagine with an older audience, we can get into a little more detail on some different things, so. Yeah, I've been plugging it on the team Discord, so hopefully we get some people. <laughs> we'll and you have a lot of teen artists as well, so I, they would probably be interested in putting, like, seeing Ooh. the process of putting stuff together. Because yeah, anime was, is so popular. <laughs> like, the, when we do it for the kids, sometimes the quickest way to do it is, like, here's a little history. Here's the people that do it. Here's about writing a story. Let's do the activity. Let's read the book. But yeah. I have to admit, I was pretty impressed, like, with Jackson's comic, with Deb. And even though Ian didn't have his, he had the idea. So yeah. that was a lot I, better than, believe me, most of the time I do these. So I'm just well, not I used think to doing it like this. This is a very weird for me. Yeah, so thank you for being flexible, definitely. Oh, yeah, no Please, and thank I you, think Nina. If you can show yeah. her a pay raise, make sure she gets one. I do not. I know she's had to email me. Weird. About this. <laughs> no, but, neither of um, us control pay raises. <laughs> no. I tried. But yeah, and if we, I mean, if after things open up, if we were to have another live one, I think it'd be really cool to have more of like the workshopping stuff too. So yeah, cool. trying but, to, this is the presentation that I always struggle with because it's trying to condense it to make it fit like I can talk about comic history for hours I can talk about making a comic for hours I can talk about the different jobs in it you know it's it's tricky to try to do it like in one way and then you get tangents and things like that so mm. but I feel like they're all important things because you learn from your history so yeah I think there was a lot of comics it's tricky so mm. I think it was a lot of interesting information. Yeah, so thanks. Oh yeah, okay, no problem. I, I'm going to end the meeting um, and then I'll, the team oh, one Jackson, is a different you, link, so. Jackson, tell your dad, just shoot me an email with your question or a, or a message on Instagram. His dad and um, I follow each other, so. Well, <laughs> it isn't really a question. Um, I was, so whenever, the last time we he had a, um, Whenever there was going to be a Comic Con, but there wasn't because it was canceled. Um, my mom made me do a bunch of things because she really thought it was going to happen. And I told my mom, but what if it doesn't happen because of the coronavirus? And then finally, she's like, it probably will. And then later, she's like, guess what? It was canceled. And I'm like, I told you. <laughs> That's the well, big thing, so. 
but all that stuff that you made you can save for next time yeah that's called inventory <laughs> yeah. all right see you guys all right bye, bye. thank you